My story begins after my parents fell in love. 18 months previously, mum and dad had welcomed my older brother Matt into the world. So when mum's contraction started for the second time in her life, in the middle of dad's soccer game, she headed over to the hospital and it was later that night I made my appearance. And half an hour later, my twin sister Katie emerged. Apparently I'd been sitting up like a little Buddha, hogging all the space. So when I was finally evicted and Katie had some space to move, it took a little convincing for the doctors to coax her out. My brother Matt was headed towards two years old and while he remembers nothing of meeting Kate and I that day, he has vivid memories of the incredible chocolate bar Dad bought him from the hospital vending machine so he wouldn't get jealous of all the attention his new baby sisters would get from excited family and friends. Growing up a twin gave me the greatest childhood. Though Katie had always been my best friend, but for most of our childhood Katie suffered with ear infections which led to more serious operations before it was finally resolved. But this also meant that because her body was constantly fighting infection, I was always bigger than her, always fatter than her, a fact I was reminded of constantly. It really took its toll on my self-esteem, which led me to believe that Katie was the pretty one and therefore I picked up the task of being the funny one. Katie noticed this too, but it was truly our friendship and love for each other which was the greatest memory of my childhood. I made her feel hilarious and she made me feel beautiful. When we were three years old, my family moved to a little country town called Nabiak. I still remember, clear as day, driving into our garage for the first time and seeing two little blonde haired kids sitting on the neighbour's fence watching us move in. We didn't know it at the time, but it was Owen and Rhea, who would become permanent fixtures in just about every story we would ever tell from the age of three to twelve years old. Our childhood was spent racing our bikes around the neighbourhood, scraping together our pocket money to buy chocolate cigarettes and redskins from the corner store. At some stage we inherited sheer red chiffon curtains during one of Mum's redecorating jaunts, which became our princess capes, and launched our new Saturday adventure of running down to the empty church, creating wild tales of three princesses running away from their evil king father. The world was full of so much wonder and we were always creating incredible tales and adventures full of creek mud pottery, bushland picnics, backyard campouts and pizza slumber parties. It was during this time Dad worked as chief librarian of our local library, so many a Sunday was spent at church in the morning followed by the afternoon hanging out in the semi-dark library aisles while it was closed to the public. We would race up and down the aisles taking turns to push each other in book trolleys and play hide and seek using the whole library as our boundary. It wasn't until many years later we realised our brother Matt would count to 100 next to the motion detector control panel watching for which sections lit up on the panel for movement. Then he would just run straight to a hiding spot and find Kate and I nearly instantly. We spent most of our childhood believing Matt to be some kind of hide and seek savant until when we were about 15 years old and he revealed his dirty secret. As much as we loved growing up as twins, it made going undetected difficult. We were almost painfully shy around new people and the immediate novelty of people finding out we were twins saw us catching a lot of attention, which would often be followed by ostracising from other kids our age who considered us snobby because we were so shy and didn't come out of our shell quickly. Given time, we would open up and make people wish we'd shut up, but not everyone had the time to give, and so for every friend we had, we carried the scars of at least that many rejections along the way. As a kid, I didn't really have the skills to understand why people didn't like me and put it down to being uninteresting or lacking personality, and when I'm honest, every so often that old wound reopens itself and I fear that I've just grown up to still be quite unexceptional and it's only a matter of time before people around me realise and move on. It was during high school that our church took on new youth pastors, Amy and Rob, who were young and cool and refused to give up. No matter how quiet or how shy or how many times we didn't show up to events they invited us to, they never quit being interested in us. It was the first time anyone outside our immediate family had ever made us feel truly interesting and worth chasing. And it's a memory I've locked down in my heart to scare away those nasty wounds of the past. It was during one of those youth trips Amy and Rob invited us to that I had a moment which seared itself into my soul and left me altered forever. 
I'd always grown up going to church and hearing all those Bible stories, but none of it truly belonged to me. It was during the moment I had found love, I had found faith, my heart found its resting place, my heart had found home. It was also around this time that the internet made its way into everyone's homes. We are talking dial-up modems where mum picks up the phone or someone tries to call and you get knocked off the net. And it was during this time I discovered Gush, a community of people my age who shared their thoughts on life, faith and all things hilarious on message boards right across Australia and the world. Which might not seem like much now, but at the time it was groundbreaking. And it blew my world as I knew it wide open. Suddenly, the world felt so much bigger than my little high school full of silly insecurities and catty problems. It made me feel insignificant and, for the first time in my life, that felt liberating. I felt understood and as though I'd found somewhere I fit in the world and my insecurities started to loosen their hold on me and my confidence began to bloom. I took trips to Melbourne to meet new friends and the world suddenly seemed to expand. During my final year of high school, I had my first proper boyfriend, and he actually still owns one of my most horrifying memories, which was our first kiss. I'd never kissed anyone before, which physically hurts me to admit. I was 17 years old, I was embarrassingly clueless. He's really rather lucky he survived, because in retrospect, I probably nearly blocked his airway with my tongue. And that's all I'm really going to say about the fiasco, because I am truly mortified by the memory of finishing the kiss and wiping saliva away from my mouth. Yuck. I can feel you cringing and I'm cringing too. This is my life. I like to think I got better because we dated for two years, which took us off to university together where I started my studies in my Bachelor of Education degree at the University of New England. At the time it was love. He gave me a lot of comfort and security when everything else in my world was completely changing and I'll be forever grateful to him for that. He was the most I had ever loved another person up to that point in my life, but we weren't right for each other. It was during Christmas dinner as I listened to him talking to my auntie about marriage and babies that my heart seized and I guess I panicked. I couldn't see the future with him. I couldn't see it with anyone and I actually questioned whether I wanted to get married at all. There was a big part of me which saw marriage as a sacrifice of everything I wanted. I wanted a career. I wanted something which was purely mine. But to me, marriage meant quitting for babies and while I had friends who couldn't wait to do that, I didn't share that dream. Did I want kids? Yes, but did I want them now? No. I struggled with questions of love. I didn't want intimacy to cloud my judgments and change my perceptions of my relationships, so had deliberately avoided sex. A decision which, while old-fashioned and maybe fuddy-duddy, it belonged to me. It was my choice. I'd watched friends stuck in a cycle of crappy relationships maintained by the fact that the sex was amazing. I never wanted my emotions to be warped by intimacy. I was determined to hold out for someone I felt only the deepest of connections. So my heart twisted in knots as I realised I didn't think he was going to be it for me. So I called it, went home to my family for the holidays, only to return to uni a couple of weeks later and realised we were now bunked together in the same college share house. This year of uni was going to be rough. Thankfully, I had also been bunked with my uni bestie, Beck, who now lived across the hall and served as my sounding board and voice of reason when my resolve faded and I wanted the comfort of old love. With time, the feelings faded, old habits died, and new friendships were born. Beck and Carissa were the greatest distractions when uni work got lame. Joining me for afternoons spent playing pool and eating chips and gravy in the stro, or bouncing around at aqua aerobics with 15 other 70-year-old women in the pool, or drinks and dancing at Mojo's nightclub. It was around this time, after a Sunday church service, I met a spunky blonde by the name of Laura, who led me to one of the greatest paths in my lifetime. Laura and I clicked nearly instantly. We were both sassy and cheeky and giggled to ourselves as we imagined the response if someone was to swap out the CD they used for background music at church for a Ramstein CD and could often bring each other to tears at inappropriate times during the sermon by simply turning and whispering, Ixwell. Many a week, far too much of my limited uni budget was spent meeting Laura for coffee, which turned into lunch, which turned into dinner. We were inseparable. Then came Laura's birthday dinner. She invited a bunch of her friends to dinner at the Meng Hing Chinese restaurant. I only knew her and one other person at the table, Wei Jie, who had been my flatmate for two years and recently moved out. So I picked him up and we had arrived together, which I discovered later had led people to believe we were a couple, 
an inaccuracy we were both more than happy to correct the second we realised it existed. It was this night that, unbeknownst to me, I met the man I would one day marry, Tim. He was Laura's flatmate, who after the restaurant we met out at our favourite pub, The Newey, and spent the next few hours drinking and chatting and laughing before all stumbling home to Laura and Tim's apartment where Susie, their other flatmate, was arriving home also. Call it excitement, I'll call it rum. But I rode the rainbow bus that night and woke the following morning to a very pale, achy, sad and sorry version of myself lying on the spare mattress on Laura's floor. I re-entered the land of the living to find Timmy cooking breakfast for everyone in the flat. In my fragile state, I only ate a single crumpet, a fact he to this day has never let me forget. Laura had headed off to class, which left Tim and I to spend the day watching MASH episodes. The following week, while hanging out on the noisy balcony of the Stro, sitting side by side, I was chatting to someone else about something I don't even remember, because all I could think was how I was acutely aware of the fact Tim was so close to me, and how much I just wanted to kiss him. In my head, I rallied all the courage I could muster, do it Jess, do it now, or you never will, turned and planted a kiss on him. His expression was one of shock, followed by a crooked grin, which turned my insides to mush. To say I fell hard would be an understatement. By the end of the following week, I could actually feel myself falling in love, and I panicked. After all, I wasn't looking for a relationship. I was in my final year of uni, I was graduating in less than six months, I had no idea where my future would be, and my dream had been my career. The last thing I wanted was for love to derail that dream. So I called it. I broke it off with Tim too scared to fall in love. I kind of gave you the punchline in that you know we end up together, but for a couple of weeks it didn't look as though the story was going to go that way. It was when I realised what I was missing, that what I felt for Tim was unlike anything I had ever felt in my life. I thought I had felt love before, but it was nothing compared to this. I will never shake my admiration for Timmy to drop his pride and allow me a second chance, but he did, and it changed my life forever. The following six months were a blur. I fell hopelessly in love with not only Tim, but all his friends. Alex, Tim I, Kent, Britt, Lucy, Grant and Susie. My twin sister Katie started travelling up on weekends to hang out and became part of the army gang. My two worlds merged and it was the greatest time of my life. After three months away completing my final teaching prac, I returned to Armidale for a surprise reunion with Timmy before charging off to Queensland to spend some time with Timmy's gorgeous mum, Jerry, and stepfather, Richard. It was during this trip, after a long phone call with my dad, while watching a movie in the lounge room, Timmy wandered out to the kitchen, rummaged around in his bags before returning with his hand in his pocket, dropping to his knee and asking me how much I love him. Expecting him to have a Freddo frog, I said heaps and extended my hand waiting for my reward, only to be met with him whispering, I love you Jess, will you marry me? And opening a little blue box to reveal a triangle cut sapphire surrounded by diamonds. We were married one year later, our total dating and engagement lasting 18 months, a time frame which included me graduating in the top 15% of my class with my Bachelor of Education degree followed by chasing Timmy to Melbourne to pursue his dream of drawing houses and me picking up casual work as a teacher at an autistic school. Timmy had changed my ideas of marriage. As much as he wanted kids, he was willing to wait, to allow me to live my dream of a career and a time for us to enjoy us before bringing kids along for the ride. We did, however, extend our family with the pitter-patter of four tiny feet and Jester, our Siberian husky, joined the clan. After two years in Melbourne, I missed family and yearned for a new direction. I felt teaching was not my great passion and hoped to move into admin. I accepted a position as children's services team leader with council back in Foster, New South Wales. So back up the coast we went. We spent four glorious years living in Foster, back with Katie, John Boy, Matt, Amy and Rob, who somewhere along the way had shifted from mentors to friends and a new lad on the scene, Katie's boyfriend, who would later become her husband, Matt, who, to avoid confusion between the two Matts, we called him M2. We built up ridiculously strong friendships with this mob who still exist as some of the greatest friends to this day, with our Armadale crew catching up every so often and still remaining the best of friends. 
Those first years of marriage were rough. Money was tight and we were learning to do life together, but we're making it. As I record this, we have been married seven, coming up to eight years, and we're stronger than ever. Timmy's been so patient as I experimented with career changes, trying my hand at being a cinema usherette and administrative temp. We bought our first home before we moved again to Port Macquarie to follow Timmy's dream for his job. We battled through my redundancy before taking on the role of customer relations and office coordinator and adopting a new rescue dog, Mishka, which has taken our Siberian Husky collection up to two. Who knows what the future holds? I'm currently in my 30th year of life and looking back on all this craziness, I would never have imagined my life to be where it is now. I have so much goodness around me. I realised every rejection has served to help me recognise true friendship and love in my life. I have been flabbergasted by the incredible people who have crossed my path. I am blown away by the joy of calling my family my friends and my friends my family. And now starting YouTube, a channel to unleash some pent up creative energy. Anything can happen and it can happen anytime. So what's next for us? Kids? More dogs? New career? New location? Who knows? All I know for certain is that God is good and life is beautiful.